Okay. So here we are. Uh, welcome back. It's Mark Littlewood from Business of Software. Um, we are getting very, very excited about Business of Software Europe, which is happening in just over two weeks. And the only thing I think that is more exciting for us is we're joined today by Bridge Mirinov um, to talk about product management and the four laws of software economics. So say hi, Rich. Hello. Hi, everyone. How are you? Uh, excellent. It's it's morning in San Francisco, and uh, we're waiting for the sun to come out. So um, life is good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we uh, actually had bright, bright sunshine yesterday morning. It was fantastic over here in Cambridge. And by 2 o'clock, it was snowing. <laughs> and, and then it rained all night. So we have literally had four seasons in the day and uh, it's all getting a bit wintry now. It was uh, it was so nice last week, I think that was summer, and uh, we won't see any more of it, but um, that's a shame. So I caught up with Rich recently uh, over in Dublin, um, which coincidentally is where Business and Software Conference Europe's gonna be. Um, he did his talk at uh, Product Tank at Dog Patch Labs. Uh, how how uh, did you find Dublin? Uh, as always, I've been to Dublin many times, and I'm always thrilled. Uh, warm people and great hospitality. Um, I, I do a little teaching at DIT, uh, Dublin Institute of Technology has a certificate program in product management and they're good enough to bring me out once a year for a few days of teaching and that gives me a great opportunity to knit together a trip. This time it was Dublin and then on to Cork and then on to London where I uh, had a chance to do product camp in London a couple of weeks ago. So always a great time and I love Dublin. Fantastic. Uh, one of the things I noticed was that um, I pretty sure I could almost do that presentation. I just wouldn't have the authority for it. Um, so th this was the four laws of software economics talk that uh, you did for uh, for us last year at Boss. Catch us up with that because uh, I, I hear you're going to be writing a book on the topic. Indeed, and, and thanks for the push to uh, get that material built for, for Boss last year. Yeah, we're going to turn it into a booklet. I think it's probably only 20 pages, 25 pages. Uh, but I had first turned this into a series of blog posts to get my thinking clear. And then from there, you know, we'll see what, what medium it turns into. But the, the sort of takeaway from the four laws was my observation that the sales and marketing side of most software companies really doesn't believe in the same laws of physics as the engineering side as fronted by product management. And so we sort of called out the, the seemingly obvious things that no engineering team is ever as big as you want it to be because you can think of stuff for them to build faster than they can build it. So we've got to ruthlessly prioritize what we're going to do. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we talked about how software is not the product, software is a part of the product. You've got to have good understanding of customers and targeting it to the right place and pricing and channel strategy would be really good. Um, you know, we talked about uh, magical thinking, which is that if I want it hard enough, I'll get it. And then I think the big takeaway was that in the software business as distinct from the uh, custom development business, if you're in the volume software business, all of the money to be made is in the additional copies that you sell or additional subscribers that you sign up or additional transactions that you do without having to build more software. So in the, in the sort of financial sense, building software is a fixed cost per unit time. I'm going to spend $2 million this quarter with my team, but I better be able to sell that to many, many, many companies or individuals, that's where the money comes from. It's on the scale, it's on the margin. Got you. Um, and so one, one of the things uh, that uh, you, you, you talk about is magical thinking. What's the difference between magical thinking, and, and obviously nobody believes in magic, and CEO thinking? Uh, so, uh, well, often they coincide, right? <laughs> I, 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 I guess for me, Magical thinking is all about going back to our inner five-year-olds and I really want another cookie and my parents are trying to explain to me why either there are no more cookies left or one more cookie will be bad for me or I should eat my dinner first or supper depending on where you're from or there's all these reasons why 
the world wants to not give me another cookie, but indeed I still want another cookie. <laughs> and so when, whenever uh, the sales team comes back from the major customer visit or the CEO comes back from the, you know, the voice of the customer summit with a checklist of things that folks have asked for, we have this fundamental disagreement where the folks asking for it believe it should be done because they're asking for it, even though there's no white space in the development calendar, even though we're going to have to push something else out. And the magical thinking is that if I ask for it often enough, loudly enough, clearly enough, then somehow resources will be created, God will inherit me 27 more development teams, and I could get everything done. So I call it magical thinking to highlight the fact that um, just asking for it doesn't make it so. <laughs> okay, so um, if you uh, are watching and you want to ask a question, uh, preferably product management related or product <laughs> strategy related, but we do bill this as an ask me anything, so uh, do feel free to ask Rich anything. You should be able to ask questions using the Q&A feature on, uh, it's usually on the right hand side, but uh, Google uh, shuffles these things around from time to time just to keep us on our toes. Um, so you can add a question and we will um, uh, we will ask it. You can also ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag um, boss2016 because uh, it's 2016 and this is boss. So uh, first thing, when I was on the flight over, the, over to Dublin to um, go and see some people and we came to see you, I read a Medium post <coughs> by Dave Cancel uh, about why he never employs product managers with experience, um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, Rick, uh, Dave is one of the one of the smartest uh, practitioners. Uh, he's one of the kind of smartest product-focused CEOs um, out there. He's, he did a great boss talk a few years ago, and he's fairly kind of unique. But uh, a number of people, you you included, took um, slight umbrage to that. I think I put 1,200 words up. Um, and first, I put it on Medium as a response to David. And, and David's built some great products over the years. You know, I really respect what he's done. I, I think on this, he's he's not thinking very clearly, as as I indicated. But uh, you know, I think if if we if we unpack it a little bit, I think it's great to say that you want to hire product managers with energy, with vision, with young thoughts with enthusiasm, there's all kinds of qualifications you might want to put on that. Um, for me, it comes down to the question of, if you had two candidates who each had all those characteristics and one of them had done this job before, had been a product manager on some successful product, would you send that person out of the interview process? Would you turn them away because they've actually done the job before? Uh, uh, that seems clearly not to be true. In fact, if I if I take the, the sort of obvious uh, analogs outside of product management. Uh, let's imagine that we need an enterprise software architect for our enterprise software architected product. And we're gonna put up some, some uh, interviews and we're gonna bring people in. Um, one of the very first questions you'd ask every single candidate is, tell me about products you've built and tell me about products you've architected. Uh, the idea that someone could walk into the job and declare themselves to be you know, a senior software architect without having built any software seems um, disingenuous. Uh, likewise, if we were gonna hire somebody to be the CFO of our company, we'd really like them to know something about finance. Uh, the person who runs uh, customer support, be great if they knew something about supporting customers. I think the idea that, that uh, experience in product management is a disqualifier uh, seems very odd to me. Uh, I take the opposite position. Uh, in fact, I'm interviewing uh, candidates for uh, a client of mine right now, and I'm discarding everyone who doesn't have product management experience. Most of the people I talk to who think this is a fun job turn out uh, to be disappointed. So I'd rather have them find that out on someone else's product. <laughs> Why are they disappointed? Uh, it's a really hard job. It's a special job. Um, the product management job has no authority. It only has responsibility. And you've got to work with folks across the company, all different functions, all different personality types. There's a certain, you know, sort of flexibility you've got to have to negotiate with engineers differently 
than the way you negotiate with salespeople, uh, etc. And it's uh, uh, you know I liken it to the Australian sheepdog that herds sheep only because honestly it can't do anything else, born and bred for it. Uh, anyone smart enough who can do something other than product management probably should go off and do that. <laughs> So this is a this is a really great question from uh, Liam Atherton. Uh, right. I'm not sure where Leon is. I uh, don't know if you can see it, but uh, I'll read it so you don't even have to look. You can close your eyes. Uh, what does a good meeting between product manager and technical team consist of, and how often should it occur? Ah, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> I think you know there's there's meetings of all sizes. So so if we imagine the sort of um, smallest possible company, uh, you know, the startup I'm at right now is 25 people. So, you know, they've got three very small teams of about five technical firms each. So, so uh, there's a daily standup and I go to the daily standup and mostly I don't talk because they don't need me to talk. Uh, but, you know, a good meeting between a product manager and a technical team probably is about the product person framing an issue. Here's how customers are asking for a particular thing, uh, but generally the customers don't understand the solution set. So how do we unpack this to discover the right problem that's underlying whatever the customer requests are? And then everyone around the room is going to try to come up with good solutions. Um, I often say that it's not important for the product manager to be the smartest person in the room. It is important for the product manager to get the smartest people into the room so that we get really good answers. So, you know, it's much more about understanding and sharing and guiding and leading, hanging metrics or business goals on top. And then the smart people figure it out and ask any engineer and the engineer will tell you the smart people are probably engineers. Engineers do say that from time to time. <laughs> I, I've been told. Uh, I aren't an engineer, but I were one once. <laughs> Um, Sophia, I, uh, I'm going to ask that question when you've rephrased it as product manager, not project manager. Um, but uh, I'll come. I'll come back to it. Sorry, that's uh, another question that's come up that I'm going to um, ask you. Then the the other uh, follow-on from Leon's question is, what was a good meeting between product manager and salespeople? Ah, uh -huh. okay. Those are those are much more delicate. And and in, you know, <laughs> delicate. In, in general, you know, that's a meeting where the product person is trying to describe what the ideal customers look like, what our segment is, what our target is, what problem our product actually solves. And the salespeople are describing the customers they have met. And we're trying to find some intermediate place where we're actually selling the right thing to the right people. So, uh, you know, important to know that on average, salespeople make twice what product people make and they do a really hard job, which is selling. Um, they're not always as disciplined as they need to be about uh, you know, vetting the customers and make sure the customers actually need what the products do because they get paid either way. And so you know, there's this very intricate, delicate dance where product folks are trying to nudge the salespeople toward the right customers, and salespeople are trying to nudge the product people toward whatever it is that customers say they want. <laughs> Humbly, I say this. <laughs> can 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 product managers train salespeople to be a bit more? I guess is, I mean all salespeople have this consultancy sales driven thing, right? But right. are they trainable? Um, yes, and, and I might ask a question a slightly different way. And by the way, I, I need to say I'm an enterprise B2B guy where sales teams really still exist. If you're in the consumer space where you're trying to sell millions of something, um, you may not have sales in the way that we enterprise folks understand it. You know, it's much more marketing. It's much more uh, online and A-B testing and, and behavioral. And I think folks are much better aligned around goals because – when we're marketing to a million million people, we actually care less about each individual person. Um, but you know, I, I turn it around and say, how do we find great VPs of sales or heads of sales who can think strategically, who can direct their folks into the right markets, who can set up uh, processes to vet customers? You know, so there's an early gate in the process where 
we ask whether that customer fits what we're doing and whether they have the problem. And I think that's got to come primarily from the sales management side. Uh, product managers are uh, necessary annoyances to the sales process unless we have a customer who's got a technical problem that needs to be answered with a yes. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, uh, I, I've worked with some great VPs of sales and heads of sales, and the great ones are the ones who understand that not every customer is a winner, and we need to point our salespeople toward the most likely and most successful customers, because ultimately, they'll love us, they'll pay us money, they will renew, and they'll give us good references. Gotcha. Um, I love this question here um, from, and this is one that we always like asking our product management gurus, what's your favorite software product and why? How would you improve it? Ah, this, this is tough. Um, as, a, as a very small business owner, well, not in stature, I'm nearly six feet tall, but um, uh, running a business of one at where I am all the employees, one of the things I am is the CFO and the uh, accounts payable department. And I'm using a great, great product called Zero. That's mm -hmm. spelled X-E-R-O, not Z-E-R-O. Uh, it's out of uh, Australia, although... New, Ze New Zealand, I think. Is it from New Zealand? Right. I'm going to apologize. Yeah, this is like calling them Canadian Americans when they're Canadian. No. So, so um, I'm actually meeting some folks uh, next week who are going to be in San Francisco from them. And they've got a beautiful, elegant, online, simple uh, bookkeeping bill paying, um, uh, tracking things. Some of the great things it does is it, it actually taps into the bank account and pulls all the transactions from the business bank account and reconciles it against my transactions. So uh, it's a great product. I love it. It's really easy to use. And one wouldn't know where the team was. Obviously, I'm not clear on that uh, because it looks like the local product it should be in the place it is. So. Um, no, they they uh, they are out of New Zealand, but they've been around. Uh, they've been around all sorts of places recently. Uh, I think that some of them are based in the UK. Funnily enough, I, I have a very similar favourite product, which is a, a thing called Cashflow, and that's Cashflow with a K. Um, and this was actually one of the first UK. Well, I think they didn't have a Cashflow URL. Um, it's one of the first. SaaS products to come out of the UK. It was set up by a guy um, who spoke at Boss Europe last year. We did a, a, a really interesting um, fireside conversation with him. He, he's a brilliant speaker, but he hates speaking. So we did a, a sort of series of questions. But um, he wrote the book on kind of SaaS guerrilla marketing and took um, as his uh, target, Sage, the uh, big uh -huh. accounting company, sure, um, and did all sorts of things to uh, to get product out there, including when Sage about uh, they were doing an online SaaS product. He got early access to it, and then wrote a very long review of all the security issues in it and posted it on his blog. <laughs> So oh. he um, he was absolutely he was uh, he's he's brilliant um, and as he said himself you know his his CV is a little bit unusual you know the education well that's a blank uh, I was brought up in a children's home um, he taught himself to code uh, went kind of got into got into a kind of a bad crowd and ended up being arrested in uh, Atlanta Airport with seven and a half thousand ecstasy tabs. Um, um, <laughs> Can't say I was there at the time. If I was there, I didn't see anything. <laughs> As a result, went to, went to prison, both in America and then over in the UK. And as part of that, he decided that when he came out, he got involved in the thing called the Prince's Trust, which is a kind of youth training um, and rehabilitation scheme, and decided he would, he would set up a business creating websites for people. And as he was setting up the business, he realized that he couldn't understand how to work out how to use the accounting package. And that then became his business. And he sold it two years ago for a very, uh, very, very nice return. So a fantastic story. Um, and, and is similarly simple to use um, as, uh, as Zero. So if you are thinking about Zero, that's with a Z, right? Um, not, not here, it's not. <laughs> also check out Cashflow. Um, 
So, uh, okay, let's um, let's move on to a, another question. Okay. Uh, I'm assigned the PM role in a B2B startup on a flailing new product. No, this, this isn't a serious question, is it? This doesn't happen. Um, we've been able to. <laughs> all, all of my 1.0 products have been wildly successful. But go ahead. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing Burr is uh, Burr is not using his real name here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on a flailing new product, we've been able to sell upsell to existing customers, which isn't getting sticky usage. Trying to just guide buyers to usage, but sales marketing leaders are tricky to access. Advice. Uh, well, you know, let me unpack that and, and sight unseen, never, never knowing what the product actually is. Uh, I, I would, I'd first observe that in fact, sales and marketing leaders are very tricky to access. There are hundreds or thousands of companies trying to, uh, create products that they think sales and marketing leaders want. And, uh, most of them they don't. So, you know, I, I'd probably start with, with the unvarnished, uh, re-interviewing of a handful of the the current customers and asking whether the thing really adds value. So, um, you know, I, I, I've been known to say that there's nothing more uh, wasteful than building a product that no one buys, but perhaps even more wasteful is a product that a few people buy, realize has no value and give right back to you. Right. So, um, uh, you know, so, so be good to know if there's real goodness and real value here, because if not, then everything else is, is pyrrhic. Um, you know, from there, uh, you know, there's probably two or three functions or features that are the ones that are valuable. You know, if we take our page from the intercom folks, we should probably instrument the product and figure out what two or three things people actually use. And ideally, those are the ones that we promote as having benefits. Uh, sometimes we'll discover that the three features that are used all the time are never mentioned on the website or on the data sheet because we didn't think they were the important ones. <laughs> so again, that's sort of fundamental. Um, you know, and, and then maybe the stuff is just hard to use. So uh, you know, unpack a little bit of UX or workflow and figure out whether your thing is just you, you know, difficult. Um, I've, I've used some products that are designed to be successfully used only by very smart people. And I observe that's a bad segmentation strategy because most of your users won't fall into the very, very smart category. And so the products have to be easy to Snapchat use. Snapchat category, isn't it? Is it all, I mean, not necessarily smart, but Snapchat's deliberately designed, so. Right. As opposed to, by the way, our earlier this morning and yesterday exercise, and forgive me for anybody from Google who's on the phone here, but um, Hangouts, not the easiest thing to use. So. Um, uh, and I've used every possible bit of, of teleconferencing and Skyping and WebExing and every time I come at, at Hangouts, I have to start all over again and read the manual or get somebody to walk me through it because they've moved my cheese and changed my interface. They do move the cheese. There's no, there's no question. Do. Although I have to say we've tried all sorts of other different types of, uh, of, of, Discussion for like this, and right. nothing, nothing really does it as reliably or as um, as as consistently as as Google. At the end of the day, it is tough to work out. But uh, even things like um, yeah, Citrix and the the, the yeah, I, um, I, I admit to liking none of them, but you know, <laughs> but but one ends up with a ranking of of products that you dislike the least being at the top. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, um, Sophia, thank you for this question. Uh, should a product manager also be a developer, or do you feel that the role should be separate? Uh, well, uh, I were one once. Um, I, I, by the way, I go to the meetings. You know, I stand up at the front and say, "Hi, uh, I'm a former developer." But uh, I prefer not to. And, and here's the challenge: um, if you're doing a good job as a product manager you're probably spending 30 or 40% of your time away from your team talking with customers and prospects and looking at competitor products and wrestling with the market side of things. And you've got to actually want to do that. So I think it's great to be a former developer, but I think if you're actually writing code, which is by the way hard, as, as developers tell me, uh, that it's really much more of a heads down thing that you have to commit to. So. If you're a company of three or five, maybe 
you know, you don't have enough arms and legs to have a full-time product manager. And so someone on the team who also codes may do the product job. But as soon as you're big enough to have a full-time product person, and I would peg that at about 12 to 15 employees if you're a software company, that you really need a full-time person who wears the product badge and no other. Um, I, think if, I think if you're writing code, except on, a, on an occasional basis, to gently help your developers see another alternative, uh, then you're probably shortchanging your product job, and maybe you really wanted to be a developer anyway. So both very valuable things, although here in San Francisco, being a developer is actually more valuable on a salary basis. Um, you know, uh, they, 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 they are different animals, and I think broken loyalties, they are hard, and trying to both describe the problem to be solved and designing the solution, I think, gets really muddy in, in one's head. It's interesting you say that. We, I was talking to a guy called Peter Coppinger, who is the CEO of a company called Teamwork, um, and Teamwork's a really nice, simple-to-use project management right platform um, and he's a developer and he is now running a company and started out as a consultancy and then morphed into a product business right. and that product business is now extremely successful it's bootstrapped organically grown has 80 people uh, in the company now it's profitable um, and he's talking at business software conference europe in a couple of weeks uh, on two things one is the the transition from a consulting to a product business. The other right. thing that he's talking about is actually how much he's struggled with being a CEO versus a developer. And whenever he's under pressure, whenever he's under stress, he defaults to developer. Right. Um, and he knows he knows intuitively that he can have more impact as the CEO now. But as natural human reaction is to move back into the development. And, and I think piece. we, many, most of us do that, which is we move to the thing that we're comfortable with. Uh, you know, I might think being a product manager is a hard job, and I've only been a CEO once. I can tell you being a CEO is a much harder job. It pulls you in a lot of directions. You've got, you know, the theory that you don't have anybody as your boss is just wrong because you've got stakeholders and investors and customers pulling you in every direction. And I think if everyone, you're going to be the, everyone, is, everyone is your boss. So that's right. Everyone your is your boss. Investors, your customers, your right. And and I think I if you know if if as the CEO you retire to your den for a few hours on the weekend to code as a way to relax, that's great. But I think if you're the CEO, you've got to step out of the technical job and give it to someone else or someone's else who are going to own the product and own the code and own the testing and own the details because you're going to do a bad job of it, and also because you're going to shortchange the things that are really going to determine the success of the company. So, you know, I see companies fail much more often because the senior executives aren't paying attention to the senior executive jobs mm -hmm. than that they're short of 15 more hours of developer every week. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And, and it's not for everybody. There's no reason why one has to be the CEO, but someone has to. And so if you don't want to do that job, you've got to find someone else to do it for you, and you've got to work for that person, which is often a real hard transition. So, um, you know, uh, in or out, but but choose. Yes, right. that's a great uh, and, and, funny, funny enough, there's another, another speaker at uh, Boss next month, a guy called Nick Halstead, who started out as the CTO of his business and then became CEO. Right. And, and I see and then, I see a lot of later stage companies where the board of directors out here that's almost always venture capitalists have helpfully leaned in and let the CTO founder CEO know that he or she is actually going to be promoted to CEO emeritus and back to CTO <laughs> and they're going to bring somebody in often which with much more of a sharp sales set of skills to drive revenue. Well, interestingly, Nick started as CTO, became CEO, and that was quite early, but then stepped back and became CTO. Um, they had a, a very good and West Coast um, CEO for a couple of years, and then uh, he stepped back into the CEO position. Got and it. Ran it for a couple of uh, couple more years, and then stepped stepped away from the business and started a new business um, at the beginning of this year. So, right. um, it can it can work. 
Good. Let me let me pick up that other half of that question though before we let it go, which is professional services or contract software firms versus commercial volume software. Because I get very religious about this, um, and and in my view, the skill set, the talent pool, the organizational structure, the motivations, the metrics are all in opposition. So if you're running a firm whose job it is to do contract software development. It's all about utilization. It's about finding customers who want jobs done um, and doing the jobs that the customers say they want done, regardless of whether the end market validates that. And having a team of people who can jump onto whatever set of projects you're going to have and stuffing the pipeline full of more projects to keep those people busy. It's a great business if you know that's the business you're in. If you're in the business of volume software, if you're in the business of building software for large numbers of customers, either consumers or businesses, all of the money, again, back to our four laws, all of the money is in the volume, not in the time spent. And so what you want is fewer developers working on better software of interest to a big segment, and you want to be pushing back as much as possible on one-offs and specials and customer requests, because all of that has very little leverage. So. Again, being in the software business is great. Being in the professional services contract business is great. Uh, I think being half and half is um, a road to disaster. You're on mute, Mark. Ben, oh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so picking up on that, picking up on that. Or, or, or one of the uh, one of the one of the uh, points you're making there. Um, how do you gather data information to find out what people are really asking for in your uh -huh. product? Oh, it's magic. Um, ah, I know. I, I'm smart, and I know the answers. <laughs> uh, so, so this is so. First thing to say, this is really hard. Um, figuring out what the market wants is hard. And you know everybody should have their copy of of um, the business canvas, and everybody should have their copy of Lean Startup, and everybody should have their copy of whichever Lean UX book they're reading, and uh, jobs to be done, and and you know customer discovery. Uh, reading the books is easy. You just, you're just you're just pitching all my boss speakers for me, right? Well, That's there great. you go. Keep right. going. Yeah. Um, um, uh, I had a chance to meet uh, Alex Osterwalder here in San Francisco a few months back, which was a great honor. He's really smart. Um, but it turns out filling out a canvas once doesn't create a business. Right? There's a tremendous amount of hard work behind it. So um, I I'm going to tell everybody that if they haven't gone out of their comfort zone and talked to 20 or 30 or 40 folks who they think are actually in their target segment and are not their personal friends, and gently both pitch the problem. So before we pitch solutions, we have to validate that the problem exists, right? So there's a lot of folks who who pick up their little um, template. You know, they've got their their balsamic or their pencil sketch of their solution. They say, "Would you buy this?" And cart before horse here. You'd really like to find out the people you're talking to have a problem, have the problem you're thinking about, understand the problem and are interested in spending money on solving it. And only then, then and only then, do you pick up your beautiful little uh, pencil sketch and show them what you were thinking of. Right? And maybe, in fact, before you show that to them, you ask them the three or five or 11 approaches they've already taken. Because if they haven't tried anything, it's not a real problem. And if they've tried something and solved it, then you have no market here. So, you know, this is, uh, again, it seems trivial to say, almost everybody I work with talks about it and then doesn't do it. So, tremendous ego blow to taking your pet idea out there and having 15 or 30 people tell you it's really dumb. <laughs> right? Um, I but, genuinely went into a meeting as a sales guy in a, uh, um, one of these kind of customer um, product development meetings and the guy I was with sat down and said to this potential customer, so we've been working on this for three and a half years and you're the first person to see it and uh, you know, really hope you like it was basically the pitch. What do you think? 
<laughs> like I, and then I got I got crap for actually not closing any sales off the back of it afterwards, but because it was like, oh, the guy really liked it. That's right. And, and by the way, I work with some big companies that have two and four and eight year design cycles, and I observe that almost anything you're working on for four years is wrong before you deliver it. Right? Just it's it's just not true. By the way, there was a great post. Uh, anybody who's following Steve Blank's wonderful uh, blog series over the decades, he had a great post last week about somebody who came and chatted with him and said, "Gosh, I've built every feature that all of my customers want, and they're still not paying me money for it." <laughs> and unpacking the idea that first of all, you better choose your customers instead of having them choose you. Second, you better know which two features matter, and third, you need a pricing strategy. So. Um, you know, back to the top level question, figuring out what customers want is not trivial. It's really hard work. It takes experience. It takes insight. Um, it's iterative. Um, you never get it right the first or second time. And uh, if you want to build a great company, you have to do that work. Uh, I had the actual great opportunity to do the reverse model here. So back in 2010, a bunch of friends and I created a company, funded a company. I got a bunch of angels to put money in. Uh, we got real estate, we incorporated, we built a product, and it turned out to, to be something that the market really didn't want. So after you know decades of telling people how important it is for other folks to do customer development and market research, I was able to prove the contrary in record time, land speed record from opening to closing. What's that uh, phrase, if you can't do it, teach? Yeah, so... So that's if you why can't, if you can't teach, consult, right? That's right. That's why we were talking before. Uh, I actually spend uh, half or more of my time as an interim VP of product. So I parachute into startups as the VP of product, not as a consultant, not as a teacher, not as a coach, but to actually get the wheels turning again, because that's the only way I know to make sure my tools are sharp. And at the end of that quarter or two, either we're selling software to real customers paying us money. Or not, and so so the uh, the KPIs are really obvious to me and everyone else, and that's that's more fulfilling than you know getting up in front of a group of people and drawing Kano charts. Gotcha. Well, that that leads us on to another question quite nicely, and I'd say that if people are watching, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, if you want to, we'll be more efficient. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to vote on the questions that you want asked or or, or answered. Um, just, uh, I think you put a plus one next to the, the question and then they'll kind of come up to the top so we can let the crowd decide, which is a terrible idea because crowds have no wisdom. Um, well, this crowd look, is look, smart look at, what, look at what's happening in America at the moment in politics um, and indeed over here. So <laughs> we need some benevolent dictatorships. So what aspects of product management do you find the most and least interesting? Ah. <sighs> I'm going to get in trouble here. So um, I've sort of moved up the stack. Uh, product management, I think, is really hard. And, and the hard thing about it is loving your product over the quarters and years and knowing that it's not perfect. And you have to stand up and represent it as if it's much more perfect than it is. Um, but what do I love? I love, um, I love sitting down with my development team and working out cool solutions to problems, particularly ones that I hadn't thought of. Um, because again, for me, it's not about ego, it's about getting good answers. I love sitting down with customers or users who tell me, on the one hand, that they love parts of my product, and we have a great, you know, we have a great uh, orgy around um, what they're doing with it and why it's fun and how it solves a problem, and then I ask them what's not so good, and they, they usually hold back a little bit because they think they're going to hurt my feelings, but they don't. So, you know, finding out, doing this sort, what's working, what's not working. And then, um, you know, for me, I spend a lot of time thinking about the economics, the, the pricing model. How does money get created, transferred? What, you know, so for me, I think a lot about pricing units. Should this product be sold in monthly subscriptions or per seat per month or per transaction or per fax or per stock trade or contribute what you think it's worth, freemium based on what. And, and for me, that's, that's really good fun because it's creative. And if you can, you know, if, if we think of Zipcar or we, or we think of the early days of, of Salesforce where they turned the world upside down by choosing a different pricing unit, 
Um, I think that's great fun. Now, most people would rather delegate that to me, which is fine too. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna pick on Harry Brown here. Uh, what do you think? Thanks, next, what do you think is the next paradigm after Agile? Well, paradigms. Paradigms, right? Well, have that's you, it. How have you seen it change over the years? So, so uh, I have to. Admit, I go to the Agile conference every year, and I do a couple of talks. <clears throat> um, the original Agile concepts, if we go back to the mountain and the snowbirds in 2001 and the manifesto was about much more than just philosophy. It was actually about building the right things. And, and what I see most of the Agile work these days isn't about building the right things. It's building whatever we're told to build with quality and velocity and on time and on spec. And, and I, I'm sort of disappointed that we've let the Agile handle devolve down to process and speed and velocity and quality because while those are all things that live within engineering and are critical and necessary, uh, they're not enough to make a successful product. Um, over and over again, I see folks building the wrong thing with quality, with velocity, you know, with great user interface, with great workflow, and no one wants it, right? And, and the, the original agile thinking was as broad as that to say, solve real problems the world needs to be solved. I think if we go back to the lean discussion, the lean folks have picked up the part of, of that side of agile, branded it differently because now we're calling it lean. But you know, the, if we split the world into uh, narrow thinking about agile is what happens within the engineering team to get good stuff built, and narrow lean thinking is what happens before we start building to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, and product management sits in between those or subsumes both of those because we have to both build the right thing. Uh, we have to both build it right and build it well, you know, so that, so that something ships and the something ships is useful. And so, you know, as a product management person, as a business person, I've got to straddle the, the narrower definition of lean. Does anybody want it? Will they pay for it? And the narrow definition of agile, can we get it built on time before the competition laps us? Um, and, and try to put those back in the same box because, of, of course, no one wants to be narrowly defined. Um, but, you know, if all we're talking about is Kanban versus Scrum, honestly, I'm not that interested in that problem anymore. You know, let's pick whatever tools work. Let's let the development team take whatever process is going to work for them. Let's get a bunch of stuff done and built and put it to market and make some money. So the paradigm shift is there's no paradigm shift. Uh, well, I, I hesitate, right? I mean, I remember in the early days of cloud computing, back in the 80s, we called it time sharing, right? Mm. So, you know, uh, ASP, there are many, right? right, yeah, I was at HP in the early 80s and, and Tandem in the late 80s, and we had this thing called time sharing, and it's come back and we call it cloud services now. Um, everything is new, you know, growth hacking, we used to call direct marketing and quantitative marketing, but it's much sexier when we call it growth hacking. So uh, paradigm shift seems awfully heavyweight. I'll pass. <laughs> okay, product releases. For a B2B product, is it better to have a timetabled release cycle, for example, one per month, or to release when the next big feature is complete? Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fanatic for a release cycle. And, and let's imagine, you know, that's a quarterly major release with some new feature or function in it. And maybe it's every two weeks that we're pushing out the thing that replaces patches because we don't do patches anymore. So if we're good, agile, we've got, you know, continuous in, in integration and automated test suites. We should be able to drop code out every two weeks, even if our customers don't want it. Uh, and every quarter, we better push out some feature function that justifies why they're still our customers. The thing I always worry about with waiting for the really, the feature to be done, I'm not sure with you, but um, development schedules only go one way, right? And so that quarterly release that's waiting for the feature tends to happen only twice a year <laughs> because stuff is late and we're only one week away and we're only one week away and we're only one week away and we notice that we're now two months late. So I'd much rather break big epics or you know, benefit things or features, whatever we're calling them, into smaller pieces and have a release cadence. And maybe that feature doesn't ship this quarter. 
and I don't get my bonus and that's just fine. But, um, you know, stuff, stuff is, is, uh, done when it's done, but it ships when it ships. Okay. Um, getting into product management. Uh, so this is Asti. Uh, what would you suggest a person with good computer science background, an MBA in product management and marketing, who aspires to transition into product management role? And as you mentioned, most companies don't consider folks with that prior PM experience. Um, I, I'll back off on that. I'd say I don't recommend anybody hire without prior PM experience. There's lots of lots of discussion here, and some of the really big companies, Google and and uh, Facebook and Salesforce, for instance, have junior or associate product manager training programs that they love to bring in uh, technical folks with MBAs and put them in that track. I don't do that because I work with small companies. Um, I, I would turn that around and say, where do I look to hire when I can't find the product manager I want? And uh, it's, it's a hard job and it's hard to learn the first time around. We make a lot of mistakes. If I'm looking within a company, which is our, my next place, I'm looking for folks within the company who know the product if not product management, and have some good customer interface. So I really like sales engineers because they've not only had to ride along with the sales team to close the sale, but they have to get the damn thing installed and working. So they've, they've faced the post-sales problem. Um, sometimes there are people, uh, sometimes I look into the development team and notice who the developers are that are really eager to, to do the hand-to-hand -hand battle with real customers. And keep including themselves in the sales meetings and the calls and, and the workshops. Uh, maybe they've got the right stuff. Uh, sometimes there's a senior person on the customer support side who's got good sense and, and understands economics. Uh, so I'm pulling from other functions because knowing the company and knowing the product are really helpful. If I bring somebody in from the outside who doesn't know my company, doesn't know my product, and doesn't know the job, then they've got a much, much higher hill to climb. So, mm -hmm. so back to Asti's question, I think, if I really wanted to work in product management and in a particular industry, I might look for those kinds of associated jobs. And then I'd spend a lot of time making sure I was good friends with the product management team. So when the next job opens up, Asti can say, remember me, I've been really interested in helping out with your committee work and doing research for you and doing interviews. I am your next product management candidate. You already know me. Let's skip that whole tiresome going outside process because I'm who you need. I've got a different answer, which just struck me as oh, you, were, you were speaking as well, which is if you have an MBA in product management and marketing and you can't spin that into a product management and marketing job, <laughs> you weren't paying attention in class, Asti. Indeed, indeed. Um, and, and I actually don't know of any MBA programs that have enough of a concentration in product management that I, I think that you, you, know, you could hang that handle. There's certainly marketing programs. Um, so Asti will reach out to me later on and tell me which program that is. Uh, so one other little, little gem I use, because I was at my alma mater, Stanford Business School just last week or the week before for a talk. And what I, what I tell new MBA grads, that it's, it's great to have an MBA, but you don't want to be an MBA. There, there's a bunch of sort of personality traits that many of us will assign to newly graduated MBAs. For instance, their heads may be too large to get through the door. And so I think the training is great, but we need to, to take, you know, 10 helpings of humility and remember that the other people at the company know things and we're the newbies. And mm. so, you know, that's really the success for me for MBAs is bring all the things you know, uh, but leave the attitude at the door, leave the ego at the door, make great contributions, be smart, make things happen. And then everybody wants to love you, promote you and put you in charge. Yeah, and I can't believe you could do an MBA in, in product management and marketing without having some product management experience as an intern, or, I mean, summer internship that you, you couldn't leave it yourself. So, you know, maybe you're just talking yourself down a little could, bit there. Could be, and, and, I, and I'm always, you know, I'm always looking for um, product managers with the MBA in either side of them and the engineering degree on either side of them because that's sort of a perfect combination. Um, and they can't work for me because I have no one who works for me. But there's a ton of jobs here in San Francisco and elsewhere that are looking for those, you know, unicorns or purple squirrels or wherever they are, hard to find. Purple bananas. Yeah. 
Fabulous. Uh, Jenny uh, says, we're investigating outsourcing some development. What are some pros and cons? Ah, back to your friend who was in prison. He would have been a con. Um, uh, let's see. I, I think this depends. First of all, I think this depends a lot on whether your organization is viewed as a profit center or a cost center. So if you're building commercial software to really make the most money in the market and your goal is to maximize revenue, um, uh, outsourcing isn't obvious to me unless you're having trouble getting the talent you need internally. I, I'm always happier to have the team of people who deeply understand my product be direct employees of my company and getting stock and being the people that I'm going to have for a long time because basically they know how to do this stuff no one else does and they leave at the end of the day if they decide not to come back I'm screwed right um, now there's a lot of good reasons to outsource I wouldn't outsource for cost savings I think that's really a mirage when you add in the travel and the crazy schedules and the remote you know issues and you know I, I guess I rarely see uh, outsourcing work from a cost basis you know finding cheaper people is not a good answer um, if you can't find the people you need, then you need to go outside and find a great team. And I would try to evaluate them, evaluate them first on being great and second on being cheap. Right? Because, again, in the software business, it's not about minimizing costs. It's about building great product fast and soon that the market loves. And I'd happily overpay people because we're going to get better results. Um, uh, let, let's ask that more narrowly. Should I want to outsource my CTO? Um, only if I think the CTO doesn't matter so much. And so I think of my development team as the scarcest, most valuable, most wonderful resource in the company. And I'm only going to go outside if I'm having trouble getting what I need. Um, so uh, there aren't any pros? Um, pros, sure. You can get teams faster. <laughs> Um, you can you can get whole teams. So there's a lot of great outsourcing firms that have whole teams that are good at things. If you're building back-end financial trading software, you can find some outsourcing firms that have built that very thing or healthcare stuff. Um, uh, there is cost leverage. There's a little bit of cost leverage. Um, there's geographic leverage. If you know if you're in a market that that has short of talent, um, again, if if you think of IT instead of software development, then you think of it as a cost center. Then, then that's a strategy. Um, but I'd be looking for an outsourcing team that wants to be with me, and I want to be with them for years. Right? I think, you know, uh, going back to the '60s and the Mythical Man Month, getting a bunch of folks to work on my product for six weeks—that's that's just a dumb idea, right? Um, adding test people who aren't going to be on the product for a long time, right? Adding test people when my developers should be writing their own tests because that's their job. Um, you know, I think you need to unpack why you're going to outsource rather than assuming you're going to outsource because there must be a good reason. Cool. Okay. We are getting close to time. A um, couple of questions here. Leon again. Uh, whose voice is most important when planning future developments? Well, mine. Your uh, sorry. Course. Developers, product manager, customer, prospects, marketing, management. Yeah, so so I, I would turn that on its head because as soon as we decide in advance which of those voices is most important, uh, we're probably wrong. So every one of those groups has strong biases. When we talk to our largest customers who've been us the, with us the longest, uh, they haven't done a new installation in years, and so they're not noticing that our onboarding is terrible. And when we talk to the customers who complain the most to our support line, we're getting only the people who have real support issues and not the other 92%. When we talk to our developers, we're biased toward solving interesting problems. So um, I, I think you've got to, again, unpack this and ask, what are my business goals? What's the market telling me? And we're going to weigh all of those against each other uh, and figure out what's true. Um, without a strategy, all of this is wasted. And without a strategy, you can't figure out which groups matter the most right now. If we're trying to grow our customer base, the most important people are folks who haven't bought yet. And if we're in late stage harvesting because there will be no more customers, the most important people are the ones who we're afraid are going to cancel their support contract. Right? And if we've got no customers, the most important people are 
those crazies who might be the early adopters. Yeah. Cool. Uh, one, oh gosh, this is quite a big one, but it's got a few <laughs> votes. As a startup guy, how would you go about starting up a product business today? Um, how much would the approach change from a software company versus a physical product? And I wouldn't. I've been there and I got hurt badly. Uh, so uh, how would I start up a product business? Again, I, I, I'd start with a lot of the customer discovery stuff. I'd go back and read everything Steve Blank wrote in the 80s and 90s and 2000s before it became hot. Um, and really, really find a problem first before I turn my expensive engineering team onto building it, because then we're committed. Um, do I think there's a big change between software and hardware? Um, well, physical products. So, so let me separate hardware in the in the computing sense from physical products like sweaters or vacuum cleaners, of which I know nothing. Right? I think hardware is becoming much more like software again. Uh, I know some folks in, in Palo Alto who are doing one-week design cycles on hardware because they've yeah. gotten themselves some 3D printers and CNC machines, and they can knock out a hardware prototype every week or every three days. Um, the Google folks early on Google Glass were doing 24 prototypes a day, right? So and I think came hardware, up with that. well, as, as it were, right? Now, if you're doing <laughs> medical research, so by the way, here's a hint. If you go out on the market and ask people whether they would like a cure for cancer, you're going to find a pretty high score for that. Um, turns out building a cure for cancer is harder. So, so you know, building commercial software or, or consumer software is easier than finding a cure for cancer. So finding the problem is important, uh, but know your limits here. Um, and then you know, build a great small team that wants to work together. It's not about numbers. Uh, I find that, that the first three engineering hires are probably the determinant of the success of the company. Because if they don't ship anything or they don't get along or their egos are too big or they don't have good architecture, you have a steaming heap of bits you can't ship. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, <clears throat> look, I think uh, we, should, we should leave it on that because we want okay. to be uh, conscious of time, not that uh, we couldn't sit here and gasp for another and, hour. And folks who didn't get their questions answered, can you just drop me a note? I'm very easy to find. You are. Uh, Rich Mironov, um, M-I-R-O-N-O-V. Uh, Rich, as in fabulously wealthy. Um, <laughs> and, and it's rich at mironov.com. So hard name to spell, but easy to find the email address. Or just Google the four laws of software economics. That's it. That's we it. probably actually had the crap out of that already just to, uh, just to beat you to it. But, uh, Thank you. We really, we really haven't. Um, great. Um, and the other uh, thing I'd leave you, you guys with here is that uh, Rich will be joining Steve Johnson at uh, Business Software Conference US in September, which is very exciting. And um, I uh, see the pair of them as um, the Waldorf and Statler of um, the product management industry. If you know the Muppets, you'll know what I mean. <clears throat> Um, but uh, no, really excited about uh, having you back and uh, doing something a little bit different. We generally don't do uh, we, we generally don't gen, generally don't do much more than, than sort of single people talking in depth about something they really care about. But uh, we're I'm really not excited. single anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I, um, and uh, very happily so. So we will uh, we'll see you, if not in Ireland, at the fabulous Powers Court Hotel in a couple of weeks, um, maybe over in Boston, and we have a ton more cracking hangouts coming up, um, including uh, Gail Goodman, who is coming back to Boss in September, Boss US. She did the uh, an incredibly incredibly insightful, long, slow, SaaS ramp of death talk that um, people people sort of cite as one of the most inspirational um, uh, talks around uh, software as a service and how you grow that. She was running a SaaS business in 1999, um, wow. sold it, or took it on to NASDAQ and sold it last year um, and has now left and we're going to be kind of catching up on what she's up to. Uh, we've got Paul Kenny who's talking about uh, well, he can talk about sales, but actually the thing that um, the hangouts around is uh, difficult conversations and why you need to have difficult conversations. For He's quite people. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. They all are. Um, and there's another one, Joe. I've forgotten. 
It's because I'm so excited about talking to Rich, but <laughs> no, I got Paul. Gail. There's another. Oh, hang on. No, I can't even announce it because it hasn't been. Uh, it hasn't. We haven't got a confirmed date. But uh, so there is another really cool one as well. To kill us. Yes. <laughs> but um, stay in touch, Rich. Okay. Thanks, stay thanks much so for much for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for being here, and we'll see some of you soon, and uh, some of you at the next hangout. Take care. Cheers.